you never know what golden <laughs> nuggets nuggets are going to pop out. Yeah. So <laughs> that's right. All right. Well, I'll give you a three count. Go and ahead. Three, two, one. Welcome to the Dune Saga podcast. I'm David Moulton. And I'm Scott Herzog. And I'm Jim Arrow. And on this episode, we return to the story part of the Dune universe. That's right. For Sisterhood of Dune. Oh, yeah. 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 Sisterhood. We, yeah, we've headed back to uh, the era of the legends of Dune books. Uh, this takes place, uh, what is it, about... 85 years. No, it's, 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 it's more like a, it's like a hundred or so years, a okay. couple hundred years, so, 200, 200 years since the, somewhere around 200 years after the Butler and Jihad. Okay. I know that they mentioned it's like two, at least two generations out from the other stories. Yeah. Um, and we start to see the forming of uh, some of the pinnacle schools that we're very familiar with in the storylines. Oh, the, so, uh, yeah. Um, so, so, I don't want to get technical on you guys, guys, but the very first, the very first line of the book is, of the book. it has been 83 years. Hey, I, I said 80, since, right? Since, I believe, what? the Battle, Battle of Corn. Yes. Okay. Well, see, now, so, the, so it depends what we're talking about. Okay. That started way before the Battle, Battle of Corn. Yeah. And so technically, if we want to be, <laughs> if we want to split hairs here. <laughs> Technically, well, I'm not that far sad. Right. Okay. Can you turn Jim up a little bit for me? No, no, I can't. No, go, go. Uh, yeah, so I guess a super brief summary would be, like I said, we're looking at the beginning of the schools. We've got the sisterhood forming. Just so you know, that's the name of the book. So there's a lot of focus on uh, the 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 sorceresses of Rossack. Uh, wait, did you say a lot of focus? <sighs> There is focus. Okay, good. I like, I like that. I like the terminology a bit better. We'll talk about that then. Go ahead. There is focus on the on the sorceresses of Rasek turning into this new sisterhood and uh, exploring the idea of connecting their genetic history. We've also got uh, some stuff going on with the Suk School in the background. Um, the navigators are kind of coming to fruition uh, with Norma Senva and her her teachings it's good to have norma back yeah i really like to have her back and uh and then uh we got an interesting look probably my favorite part of the book is gilbot gilbaltris gilbertus 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 albanus yeah <laughs> look at you and see i understand you now because when you listen to the audiobook your pronunciations just fall apart <laughs> right well these are the I'm, i assume that these are the pronunciations that he's been guided to pronounce based yeah. on from his conversations with brian herbert yeah so that's the way that's the way Brian pronounces it. So I think Gilbertus. that it's probably as good of a uh, authority as we have. Yeah. <laughs> so we, but we get to see um, the real struggles of creating the Mentet School. Yeah. That was my most interesting. And then we have, of course, the shipping lines. Mm -hmm. Venport. Venport Enterprise. Ch and the beginnings of Chom a little bit. Yeah. Um, even even like the forming of the Lancerad and uh, yeah. and the way that the houses work, like yeah. you can you can see that's kind of in disarray coming together. So a lot going on in this book. There is, there is, and uh, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, first impressions, man. So you, you get in this book before we talk about it. What, oh, what are your thoughts? Did you like it? Did you uh, not like returning to this universe? How did how did it feel to you? Jim, how about I peg you on the spot and you go ahead and tell us. Uh, so you got into this book. What was it like to return back to this world? Um, go. I really enjoyed it. I felt right at home. Uh, as soon as I saw his name, I was hooked. That's all that it took for me. Um, I, I, There wasn't anything really about this book that I did not like. Yeah. All right. For me, uh, it was a bit jarring for the first chapter, just to kind of like get back and kind of remember where we left off. Off. I mean, the only real part of it I felt secure in was in, was Vorian, and everything else was kind of like, okay, okay, what's this person's relationship? What's yeah, that? and I would agree with that. I would get Vorian oh, and Erasmus. Yeah, uh, you know, the, you know, the staples from the right and the, the one sister we kind of we kind of knew right. From the, from and the, Norma, we know, yeah, kind of. Yeah, so it's like, other than the like, staples, it was kind of, 
remembering who did what and like all the little pieces about the Harkonnens and their betrayal and everything and how that all happened. I wish that this had been done enough that we could have comfortably have done it in line. Oh yeah, because it'd have been much easier to yeah, I think yeah, <laughs> feel it out. But so, uh, but I'm right with Jim. There, there wasn't. There was only one thing about this book I didn't like, and that was that the one character was in Idaho. And, oh yeah, and I was like, why? Why does the swordmaster have to be in Idaho? Like, why can't we just let it go? <laughs> Well, and she's aligned herself with the biggest jerk in this book. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> what, what are your impressions? My impressions? You know, I have one complaint about this book, <laughs> and that is the title. Yeah, okay. I, yeah, I, yeah. I have a complaint about the title because I understand that this kind of develops a schism between the sisterhood, and you get to see like the first reverent mothers. I mean, other than the Raquel, right? The first real reverent mothers picking the Rossack drug and all that. Yeah. And so I understand all that. But it's not, but when I'm reading this, I'm not thinking, oh, this is a story of the sisterhood. I'm watching the Mentats. I'm watching the conflict between um, uh, Ben Port and uh, who's the jerk in this book? Uh, oh. I, I, don't, I refuse to speak his name. Uh, it's, not worthy of, it's, it's not worthy of my lips. Half that's what I say. Half Manion. <laughs> uh, he's not worthy of my lips. But, um, you know, that conflict, much more interesting. Uh, watching the uh, wimpy emperor with his strong brother and Anna Carino, all that stuff's fascinating. But there's so many good stories in here that, that there. It, and I'm not complaining about the way it was written. I enjoyed the book thoroughly, but for me to call the sisterhood, yeah, yeah, it was was like okay. And I'm not. And again, I'm sure that there was a reason. And each book kind of focuses in maybe a little bit more and i didn't do the comparison like how how much do the sisters appear in comparison to like the mentats for example yeah i don't know I, but. I, actually that was my final thought when i ended the book and it ends with them finally like getting to Wallach nine uh which is the sisterhood school and and, uh, and um yeah for me i was like wait i mean I loved the book, but at the same time, I was like, that's it for the sisterhood? Like, for me, for it to be called Sisterhood of Dune, I would have expected more of the story of, like, really connecting with their genetic heritage, maybe the Prana Bindu stuff coming in, uh, introduced, like, this is an entire book, and we and the, the sisterhood still has not been exposed to spice as, as like, the drug to, to bring about the change. Right. There's a lot about the sister, like, Basically, throughout this book, the sisterhood faces all of these challenges, and at the very end of the book, they're wiped clean. And now they're this new, kind of, they're almost like a new sisterhood, uh, building building from their own blocks instead of off of the sorceresses. Right. So. Right. I would have I could have seen the second book called Sisterhood if it, if it dealt more with like the starting and stuff. Well, you have two factions now that are. Oh really? Did I, I, I did start it. They two started, and you also in the second book. All I'm going to say is you see the beginning of the True Sayers. Oh, okay. So that's kind of cool. But yeah. But anyways, uh, you know, I kind of start off on a negative. I did love this book. This was a good book. Um, there were there there were some people that really irked me in this book. So. Successfully so. Yes. I think you're. It's, it's, I mean, that means it was well written. In yeah. my opinion, well written. Yeah. So uh, who's going to take us into characters? Is that Jim? Yeah, Jim's going to take us into characters. All right, man. Lead the way, bro. Uh, there is a huge list of characters in here. So I kind of broke it down into more of of the units, the family units, like Salvador Carino's family or Prince, uh, you know, including Prince Roderick, and then the happenings on some of the other, in some of the other areas. So I started out, on our list with uh, Emperor Salvador Carino, his wife, Empress Tabrino, Tabrina, uh, Prince Roderick, and his wife, Haditha, and Princess. Those were the big yeah. characters, uh, Emperor's house. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what a dysfunctional bunch. <laughs> you know, the only one in that... And that uh, bunch that seems to have any sort of healthy relationship is Roderick and, ha and Haditha. 
Yeah. You know, they yeah. seem to have somewhat a normal relationship. And, um, you know, and, and I think one of the, so, but he doesn't really change a lot. He's always like the emperor's like right hand man. The one that's really, you know, he's the one that's really running the empire. Yeah. Um, when his brother listens on him. And, um, and so I do like that. You were going to say something? Well, I don't know if I should save it for what we think is going to happen. Or not. Maybe I can reiterate it then, but I got the feeling at the end of the book, he started to assert himself more. Like, it's not a lot, but they started to mention a little bit more for almost every decision the emperor was making. He was His brother was leaning over and whispering in his ear and saying something. So I kind of wonder if the whole sisterhood calling him out and saying he should be king is going to go to his head. And it wasn't just a sisterhood. There were a lot of other people that said he would make the better king. Yeah. A lot of other people calling him out. You know, um, what's interesting in that is, of course, is the sisterhood's attempt to try and force that. Yeah. And and how in the end, even though Dorotea, and we didn't get into their relation, Dorotea and Raquel are at odds, Dorotea still fulfills mm -hmm. this function of making him sterile. Yeah. Yeah. That's I mean, I, I, I like the the arc there. I, the king doesn't grow at all in this in this book. Or not the, the emperor. He, there's no. no there's no level of growth in anything. He's pretty much a flat character. It, yeah, if anything, he becomes weaker in it. Well, he, yeah, he's a figurehead. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I, mean, I think in the in the very beginning, when Half Mannion comes, he kind of somewhat stands up to him a little bit. He's just like, I, I'm just conceding because I have to. And then at the end of the book, when Half Mannion shows up, he's wholeheartedly just like giving up and letting him do whatever he wants. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, uh, I, the, the confrontation between the sisters and I guess what eventually become the Sardaukar, uh, and the emperor there, and maybe they don't become the Sardaukar, but you know, the emperor's troops are yeah. on the planet. And when the psychic guy, the women come jumping off the cliff at him, I was like, Oh man, he's going to get it. Yeah, he's gonna get the axe, and they didn't. Yeah, they didn't. Um, but I was kind of hoping, <laughs> yeah, secretly, I was like, Come on, kill him off. Yeah, <laughs> because the other guy really comes off as someone that has a good head in his shoulders mm -hmm. and, um, and has a good family. And this is the first time that I can remember, correct me if I'm wrong, that in the series, the emperor. The person whispering in the emperor, any leaders other than the Atreides, um, with decisions, we could say was a good person. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's always mm -hmm. the, the leader's kind of bad, and then another person's worse, and they're kind of like shifting them yeah. more and more towards the bad. You know, anytime I saw a scene with that, I kept picturing Worm Tongue with. Uh, with the king of Rohan, oh, yeah. you know, he was whispering into the ear of him, yeah. the old man, and trying. But it wasn't; it was not that way. But whenever they said that, I'd be like, "Oh, that's what it's reminding him." And so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. But um, Anna, Anna Carino, I thought was an interesting character. Like she's a brat, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, has her own, but is able to control wood, which is kind of interesting, and is independent, and then uh, takes a Rasak drug and changes everything. Yeah. Yeah. What did you think of that? That change with Anna Karina, Jim. What, what would you think of that? Um. Uh, well, all through this book, I kind of felt sorry for for Anna. Um. You know, she did not get to have her own life, which would be normal, I guess, for a uh, for royalty. But then, it seems like what happened with that drug is that it kind of accelerated her and her mind is working way faster than she's able to express. And and so I would I would say she's probably just trapped inside of her own mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know what I thought? I thought they were going to take the direction and they didn't, but I thought that they were going to take the direction that this was a um that she was going to eventually turn into a navigator. Because it kind of hint pulling navigational stuff out and they kind of the the uh ben jesuits kind of hint that this is that that's kind of the direction she's headed yeah yeah and, they don't. and they don't they actually end up putting her into the mentor school but i i didn't think that she would go for navigator i just 
I, I, honestly, I'm still a mystery. It's still a mystery for me is what she's going to become because I'm sure she's meant to become something we're all familiar with. Um, but I, I just can't quite figure it out because they already have Reverend Mothers. So who would that? It's not like. I had one thought. What was that? This is a harebrained idea. Yeah. But what happens if she becomes the woman that Erasmus is at the very end of the storyline? Hmm. The woman that Erasmus is. Remember Erasmus, the male and female? Yeah. And Erasmus takes on the female role. And what if they implement, like Erasmus kind of wants to like keep an eye on her. Well, you know, yeah, well, they say they're going to introduce him at the right. end. Right. I what what happens? That, could that, could, I mean, could he take over, you mean? Like flow metal, or like integrate. I mean, the integrate at the very end, could they be leading that direction? Or I don't know. I don't know. That's a little far for me. No, a little, little far fetched for you. Yeah, Jim, what do you think? Is that a good idea or a bad idea? You know, I I gotta wonder because you bring up an interesting point. If Ptolemy gets a hold of her, she is definitely going to become a Cymac. True. Yeah. And with her mental powers, she was uh, showing telekinesis. For a while, and with her with her heightened awareness, she would be formidable. Yeah, if she if they can get her to focus. Yeah, I don't think that's so far fetched, really. No. Huh. Well, was... removing removing her from her body would might just free her enough, uh, in in order to be able to focus again. And that's true. I yeah. mean, ultimately, and we uh, we will see this by the end of the uh, third school uh, school book here. But um, Number Senva eventually kind of forsakes her body, per se, yeah. in a sense. Um, well, that's what you have to do to be a navigator, though. You you forget about any. Well, true, but it's more of a mutated a mutation, I guess, mm -hmm. of a body. But I mean, like literally forsaking the body and just becoming the mental. Well, yeah, but she doesn't go full on energy in this, does, does she? Does she at the end? No. It appears in the last book. Well, yeah, in the, I mean, in the storyline, yeah, yes. she's, she's just energy. But in this book, I don't think... No, 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 not that. in this book. But I'm saying maybe by the third book we see oh, yeah, that yeah. transition. That's what I'm saying. I can see that, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Yeah. So Carinos, yay, Carinos! Yeah, Carinos! <laughs> Now we'll move I, on to the Reverend Mother, Raquel Berto Anaro. Before you get there, the torture. Oh, yeah. Uh, brutal. This is, again, a Brian Herbert and Kevin G. Anderson. Way to go with the grotesque they stuff, like you know. They like their torture and blood and breaking fingers and pulling out tongues. I'm like, yeah, nice. Way to go. I'm cringing as I run. But, yeah. <laughs> but anyways, you were going to go on to the, uh, sis uh, the sisters themselves? Yes, Reverend Mother Raquel and Dorotea, Vela Harkonnen, or no, I'm I'm getting ahead of myself there. Well, well the sister. sisterhood in yeah. in general. Yeah. What an what an interesting situation we have here with trying and trying and trying to create more reverend mothers and all those failures. Yeah. And then the one who just happens to come up with the drug, just happens to be a butlerian. Yeah. And they knew there was a schism coming. Well, the whole, I thought it was interesting, the whole computer thing, because I had forgotten at the end of uh, Battle of Corrin that, there, that that was like a thing that they were like, they revealed that the, they had computers. Right. Um, I thought that was just a really interesting how they were trying to keep it a secret and how, what that did to them. Now, in the future, does this it? This comes up later, doesn't it? No. Does the sister ever talk about meeting computers or? You know, they they obviously have their breeding records, but they don't necessarily say how they're stored. Yeah. Well, I guess by the time we're later on, the type of machines they have wouldn't be against the strictures anymore. Yeah, maybe not. Because they they, have, well, they and they had, uh, we don't know. You know, in the second or third book, where they're going to bring these computers back, they're yeah. hidden, not destroyed. But yeah, I think the computers are going to be forgotten 
and left behind. You don't think you're going to bring them back in book two and three? I, I don't think so. She I think so. Uh, she mentions at the end, she says, when the heat dies down, we'll go get them. Yeah, they're trying to recover them. So I think that there'll be an attempt, and whether it'll be part of the whole Mannion, uh, the Butlerian uh, uprising. Yeah. And maybe it'll be, maybe it'll bring the, the sisterhood in conflict with each other again. Yeah. You know, with the Raquel faction and the, um, mm-hmm. uh, and the, um, and the Dortea faction. Yeah. You know, the other, the other thing that's a part of that that I think it's, um, uh, interesting is that Dorotea, despite um, being av- avidly against the computers, takes what they said and agrees with Raquel's assessment of the yeah. Emperor. And still does that. Yeah, I was surprised at that too. That was a twist I wasn't expecting to see. Yeah, but it was good. It was good. I, I, there was a lot of interesting weaving, like the dying out of the sorceresses. I thought that was kind of an interesting subplot that was just kind of mentioned how that was they weren't focusing on that anymore um any kind of stuff kind of at the at the end kind of come come to fruition one well, thing i really felt we didn't see much was uh, the prada bindu stuff and the fighting uh or voice and and i kind of felt the catalyst for that might be this whole them getting attacked and, and taking everything to protect themselves so they're going to have to come up with some way to keep themselves going. I don't know. They they are they are definitely a split faction, yeah. um, which is something something we don't see uh, as things progress. They always have a one minded, a single um, goal in mind to keep things going, and now all of a sudden we have. Uh, a group that, you know, we have Butlerians in inside here, creating a whole lot of problems for everybody, and it, it's it's a little scary, really. You, you definitely get the building blocks for why they start. They take take the girls as children. Why they don't know any of their parentage or heritage or anything, and you see the reasons for that here both with the the butlerian faction um or even with the harkonnen girl she was she was like all about the sisterhood but yet her mental dialogue was always thinking about when i'm done like i can help my family reclaim reclaim stuff yeah Yeah. it's honor Uh, well then then to take that another step when she found out about vori and atreides that's what she was all about oh yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. but by then the sisterhood was disbanded so, yeah. well, or, yeah, well, no, yeah. no, not at the end when he finds out about what yeah. happened to her brother. Certainly, oh, right, right. But before that, she's the one that kind of sends her brother on this mission, saying, "You got to take care of this. You got to avenge our family." And you really get the hate of the Harkonnens, like the rot coming from her. Yeah, and he, he is, he's very dynamic. He, 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 yeah, he has that. But once he gets to Arrakis, and because here, well, I guess really once he gets to the world before Arrakis, where was he living? Where was Vorian? Le- what was it? Kepler? Kepler. Yeah. Kepler. So on Kepler, when he's on Kepler and and he interacts with the family, he begins to hear these stories of Vorian. He says, "Is is this the same man?" Yeah. He begins to question it. And then when he gets to there, when he sees Vorian, that in, that initial hatred there, but when Vorian rescues him, it just this it changes, mm-hmm. and it's. Um, such a fast, immensely distraught yeah, when yeah. He, was, he was killed. Mm-hmm. Griffin yeah. reminded me a great deal of uh, of uh, Xavier. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, and these two guys, as Borean says in the book, they could have probably become friends eventually. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. And that was, uh, and so it was unfortunate that it happened. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I was kind of wondering where it was going to go if he went back and, yeah. and it was all honky dory, but at the same time. Well, this keeps it un 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 honky dory. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Like, I feel, I really feel like Valerie or whatever her name is. Uh, yeah. Valerie. Like, I feel like she shows the seeds of the evil of the Harkonnens. Oh, yeah. Like, none of the other Harkonnens, they, even when they were angry, 
they just weren't as evil as the Baron or any of the other Harkonnens we've come across. Right. And that are just like inherently bad. You know what I mean? Like the beast. The beast. <laughs> so, but, you, but there were bright spots. I mean, what? Uh, and uh, who's the beast's brother? Fade? Or the other brother? Oh, maybe Fade Rautha. But wasn't Fade like good? Not Fade. I'm thinking of... Wasn't there a brother that was kind of outcast? Yeah, yeah, and his and his parents were nice too. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, it's yeah. not like all Harkonnens are bad, but yeah, I mean, that, all, that was Abelard. Yeah, yeah, who, yeah. Who went to Lankyville. Yeah, but so I mean, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we moved on to the sisters, right into the Harkonnens. And yeah, well, yeah, they they do kind of relate uh, yeah. a, a little bit there, and yeah. Uh, well, you know, and I'll tell you what, if you carry hate for long enough inside you, it will poison you. And and the obsession that the Harkonnens gather, I think, comes is what is beginning right here. Yeah. And you you see that kind of bitterness that's just consuming the family and that you know, that that's there throughout the generations. Yeah. yeah. See, we could have gone either way here. We could have gone good Harkonnens or evil Harkonnens and with Griffin being taken out of the picture and with obsessed as Vela is, we're going to get evil people. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Because they're going to keep that feud going for generations. Yeah. Uh, I have a feeling if, if she becomes Reverend until she's got, even so I, I don't see her going back to the sisterhood. I see her continuing to spawn more children of hate. Yeah. Yeah. How about this Vorian Atreides? I don't know anything about him. I've never heard of him before. <laughs> he was a new guy, right? Man, he was totally. I, you know, he was, for me, the one, like, a breath of fresh air. When I, when I, when yeah. I hit him, I was like, ah, oh, Vorian. Yeah. Back yep. with Vorian. You know, so I, that's the way I felt. Um, and it was interesting that they kind of introduced him with the whole uh, slavers again because yeah. we were very familiar with the slavers and the Butler and Jihad and, the, and and some of those books. And they exist in that world and obviously still exist and his family being taken, brings him back into the limelight, which, of course, plays into the plot and how, you know, Valia finds out about him and sees him and, yeah. and um, you know, starts the whole thing. And I kind of feel like I... I wouldn't he was going to protect his family and i get that i really really get that but at the same time like oh you're right yeah sorry but at the same time uh like didn't he guess that the king was going to be feeling like like he was in like he didn't think of any of the ramifications of jumping back into to the limelight like he didn't think about oh the king's gonna think i'm after the throne or oh yeah uh all of our like people are gonna come looking for me now it's like i just i, I don't know i was like well why wouldn't you think about those things he, he's been around for centuries right but well, all he cared about was taking care of his family yeah he just he wanted he wanted his planet and his family left alone, and that was all he cared about. So he made it very clear to uh, uh, Salvador that he was not interested in, in taking any power, but right. his position, which was really neat, allowed him to walk in and more or less write his own ticket. Yeah. No, absolutely. At um, great and, cost. But yeah, at great cost. And, you know, the, the, thing, the thing about it is he's not a man. He can remember, like, Oh, this has happened. He knew that he he kind of disappeared because he became too big, yeah. in a sense. But that was eighty years prior that he did that. And you know, eighty years. Uh, if I lived eighty years, there'd be a lot eighty years ago I would forget. Yeah, there's a lot I forget that happened yesterday. <laughs> Let's be honest. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know. All right. Good point. Good point. But. But I, but I agree. I mean, he didn't. He did not think through the ramifications of that. Yeah, I mean, passion right. and all that. But you know, I guess the other, yeah. the other, the other, the other facet of that is he doesn't take into account that the Harkonnens are going to be hunting him. He thinks this yeah. is all past, and he certainly doesn't take into account for his brother and sister. Well, I didn't know about him. Right. Yeah. 
<laughs> but that's what, but that's what I'm saying. He doesn't take into account these factors that he doesn't really even consider or know about in that sense. Yes. Yeah, and you're referring yeah. to Andros and Hyla, of course. Yes. yes. Which, for me, was totally out of left field. Yeah, it surprised me. I was not expecting that, like, part of the story at all. Yeah. yeah. Here he is trying to, he's trying to do his thing and, and, and just get away and do what he's told in order to, to protect his family. And these two come after him and they are absolutely relentless. They are. I, I mean, They're I was a boy taking care of so quickly. Um, the question becomes, are these characters really dead? I, I actually, honestly, at the end, that's what I was thinking. I was because like, they're, they're swallowed by a worm. But remember, they are a machine. Yeah. And they have been shot, they've been hit, and they kind of regrow. And a, but a, a worm is like a furnace. Yes. So that, that, was, that was the one thing. That I, would say, I was saying the same thing. They're flow metal-ish. So how much of them is real and how much is flow metal? And could they cut their way out of a, out of a worm? That's they an interesting it. point. Yeah. Could, how, could they survive in a worm? It just feels like if, if all they did was introduce that storyline to say that these are some other siblings, um, oh, we're going to kill them at the very end. It seems kind of like, well, we have three books here. It feels like, it feels a bit of a letdown. Not that I, not that I like them and not that I was supposed to like them, but you it just, something. but it feels, I don't, okay. I don't. Yeah. And they, no, and I've, I've only just started Mentatsudun okay. and they have not appeared yet in Mentatsudun. So I don't know. Right. Um, and, and I will spoiler, uh, just say this, <laughs> that, uh, and Vorian, uh, at the, at, is it at the end of this book that he decides he's just going to fly with Venport? Yeah. So, um, because he flies with Venport, some of his trips take him back to Arrakis for a little bit. I was like, fully expect bursting out yeah. and after him, and they don't. So I don't know. Huh. I don't know where that where see, where that where that leaves them. If we are going to see them again, or if they were just uh, a plot device to get us going. I, I thought I was thinking the same thing. I was like, I wonder if they're really dead. And I was saving it to bring up during the show. At the same time. I could see them as a plot device solely to put Vorian on a path of, uh, I don't know if self-destruction is the right word, but I feel like he's going to go on a path of that to get himself killed. Not like, not like he's going to be more recluse and cause he's kind of got this guilt following him. And like, they really set it in stone. Everything he touches goes bad over time. Cause he's, he's alive long enough to see what was the thing in the, in the dark night. Uh, you don't want to live long enough to see yourself become the villain. Right. Or whatever. Huh? Interesting. I don't, you, you know, know I, I go ahead, Jim. I'm kind of with you, Scott. I think they're going to be back. Yeah. When we least expect it. That's my, uh, that's my suspicion, but I, you know, I, no guarantees. I'm not sure I agree with you, David, that Vorian is going to be, so end up being the bad, bad guy. Not I mean, a bad guy. Just, I mean, the heart can himself of, killed. The heart, the, uh, the Atreides have always had such a clean name. For the most part, yeah. throughout their history. No, no, no. I don't think he's going bad. Don't right. I feel like he is going to. At some point, that he's got to go to Calvin and start up, the, restart up the Atreides land there because didn't his sons die or something? I forget. Um, I don't remember. His wife died, there. but I don't think his kids died yet. Unless, unless, unless that's part of the value storyline that she comes in and goes to Kepler and wipes out. The Atreides, so they need to start over elsewhere. Yeah, but I, I would just—I would assume there's some sort of establishment on Caliban again, maybe uh, by book. Yeah, by book three. But but anyway, I feel like something's going to happen. That's going to—he's already like right on the brink of dep depression from this thing. Like he's given up on finding a place to live. He's just gone without a home. 
So it's like, eventually, what's the next step is not caring about, like, he, he doesn't care about where he lives, so he can't get attached to anyone. So why, what's the point of staying alive? He's not going to commit suicide, but he's also not going to not do reckless things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We, I want to go back to something. I want to take back something that I kind of chastised you on. <laughs> oh, I know. Oh. Do you know what it is? Is You said that he didn't think through his act. And I kind of said, well, you know, da, 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 you know, he just, you know, how could he? Not a mentor. But he is kind of, he's a little bit naive, at least the way they paint him here. Not only yeah. in the situation with the emperor, but the very end when he sends Griffith's body back yeah. with the note him. Yeah. And what sort of reception did he expect the Harkonnens to have? Right. And what conclusions did they think that he was really going to come to? You think they were just going to take his word as an honorable word because yeah. he wasn't Atreides? I don't think so. My thing was, like, why didn't he go with the body? Dude, I mean, and I think so. So maybe underneath he kind of knew what their response would be. You think? Oh, self-destructive. That that they would they would say they would they would come after him. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. What do you think of my theory, Jim? <laughs> oh, oh my no. goodness. I don't I, I, I tell do, you what, I, I think I, the guy I think is, is tired, tired of living. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, he's been around how many hundreds of years? Two or three. Two, two, it's 200 and some. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and he constantly see has friends and they die and wives and children and they die and grandchildren and they die. And to have to witness something like that all your life and not see an end in the foreseeable future, I think could possibly sour somebody on being immortal. Yeah. No, I can see that, but he's not immortal. I mean, he is, he 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 will die eventually. He will die eventually. Yeah. But maybe him and Gibraltar, 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 (laughs) maybe at the end, they both go to the shore and they get in a boat and they sail. Sail to the sun. What, are the, what is it called? Uh, the shine, shining shore. Or yeah. In, uh, oh yeah. Luther, Into the land of the west. The yeah. west. Uh, I just picture Scully and Mulder at the end of the second X Files movie rowing <laughs> the boat in the middle of nowhere to this island. <laughs> um, yeah, and they, you know, we're going to get to Gilberta's here in a little bit, but uh, you know these people have lived a long long time yeah mm-hmm. Norma. but these Girl. are so so maybe let's move on to manford toronto the person that scott doesn't want to talk about well uh, i and, understand that this was your favorite character too jim tell me about this <laughs> <laughs> yeah and, and his sword master assistant anari idaho i'll tell you what this guy i do not like I, I could draw a whole lot of parallels, but I, I don't want to offend people in our audience. <laughs> <laughs> we aren't talking about anything on the political stage. No, not at all. Okay, I, I, keep going. The same thing. This guy is a hairball, plain and simple. Uh, um, he makes the rules up as he goes along. He claims to be bringing forward the agenda of of um Serena the Jihad, you know but that's not what it is he is he has set himself up as the ultimate authority on everything okay and he he'll kill anybody that that he feels like would get in his way and it, it's horrible the guy is just a bung and uh his sword master anari idaho I'll tell you what, the Idaho family lost a lot of points on this one for me. Oh, man, yeah. Yeah. I just, I don't know. You, you really see how Manfred Toronto really manipulates the crowd 
and how he uses the whole crowd mentality and the, the frenzy and they really parallel it with um, a religion. In fact, he, he starts naming some of the leaders with religious titles yeah. in it. And it really seems like a, an unfounded religious frenzy where, you know, whatever, whatever it takes to stoke the fire, he's going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Jim. Well, I, I was just agreeing. I, I, he's the Dolores Umbridge of the Dune books. <laughs> uh, that's the last character that I hated this much. Every single time they come on, I'm just like, how do people not stop this person? How do people put up with it? They don't see. Ah. Yeah. So well, I agree. You know, there are so many thousands, though, that have just turned themselves over, and they're letting this guy think for them. Right. You know, tell, you, us, what, tell us what to think. Tell us what to think. Uh, gosh. Hey, uh, Jim, you, you do teach students, right? Several, yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, but, I, you know, I, this is not, I think, probably of the thing – that bothered me in this book, it was this. But I think what bothers me about it more is I see this in our society. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The fact that people, and I see students who say, just tell me the answer. Just tell me what the answer is and I'll write it down. They don't uh, want to I, think. And, and I, and I, and, and we, <laughs> it's dangerous you, ground. Dangerous ground yeah. when we don't, and you see that here. You see the the fault of allowing someone to do the thinking for you. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's it's really, really scary because we see it for real. As you said, Scott, you know, that sometimes students are just like, Okay, I'm done with that. What hoop do you want me to jump through now? Yeah, uh, okay. just give me the grade. I'll I'll do whatever you want for the grade, but you know, don't make me think. Yeah. And and the acceptance of mediocrity as a standard of excellence. Yeah. Well, you see it in here with Manfred Toronto, and I think Manfred Toronto, it's a it's a fascinating study of this sort of of, of leaders who can manipulate a crowd like that. Uh -huh. um, but also, they wouldn't be manipulating if the people just didn't care. I mean, they, or they just wanted someone to tell them what to do. Yeah. And then that. And then when everybody's doing it, it seems okay. And so, I'm just, I'm just, I think what infuriates me is we tend to be that way. Yeah. And I think that Brian and Kevin kind of really hit hit a nerve for me in this one. Oh yeah, most definitely with me too. And the mindset that it puts people in. Uh, conversation that comes to mind was Emperor and the Sook Doctor, and he's talking about, oh, we've come up with this. Uh, programming for them to uh so that they won't betray anyone he's like programming yeah and like machines yeah. and it's like well obviously they're not machines they're people right you know but that's how like crazy it, it gets you know well yeah he's making he's making his personal judgment and and making it into law and the only reason he can do that is because of all the people he has with him right yeah. Right. Who probably don't even they probably don't even know why they're following this guy. Yeah. And they certain they certainly aren't considering the full ramifications and that's the kind of uh they'll begin to explore that mentat, the full ramifications of if we carry Manfred Toronto's philosophy all the way into law. And even Gilbertus acknowledges that this is a man of contradictions. He doesn't follow everything a hundred percent. He doesn't want to of course follow. not. Yeah. Well, I mean, but, a, but Manfred Toronto doesn't oh, follow. Manfred, yeah. He doesn't follow what he's preaching a hundred percent either. If if uh, Gilbertus wasn't at the battle, I think they would have been wiped out. Yes, I think no it, doubt. It would have been the end of them there. And he, that but then the we wouldn't had a book two and three. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a, there's definitely a high level of hypocrisy with this guy. Yeah. 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 But no. What about what about Nari? I mean. She was kind of disgusting too. Yes. Um, As a matter of well, fact, their, their relationship was kind of disgusting. 
Yeah, it's in, it's an interesting relationship, and um, he makes a comment somewhere, and I and that she has, and I think it might be in the following book, but makes a comment that she has never disagreed with him in public, and whenever she disagrees with him, it's only for the matter of his safety, mm-hmm. and you see that she has followed him, hook, line, and sinker, but this is. Let's back up. Sword masters, when they pledge themselves to a house, yeah. they are with that house to the bitter end. Yeah. Well, plus, she's she's it's it's basically a Harley Quinn scenario. She's so brainwashed that, yes. that she thinks it's love. Do you know what's interesting here is so we have a, we have an Idaho that's a sword master, but but the but the Idahos are not sword masters when we run into Duncan. No. There is that, uh, you know, they're middle class, middle class, and, taken as a slave. Uh, yeah, you know, to be run by the uh, treated badly by the Har- the Harkonnens. Yeah. yeah, but that's in Brian and Kevin's books. He he is a sword master in the original Dune, is he not? Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. So. But, and, but 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 when we get the, the the three books that are immediate prequels to Dune. Um, his parents were middle class. Yeah, and, and they, then he gets trained by the sword masters yeah. at sword master school, and yeah, they, that's where we learn how he gets parents. And they, they take him prisoner instead of right, whatever, and the girl saves him. Yeah, yeah. Anyways, die tribe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then there is Gilbertus. <laughs> I, one of the most interesting storylines for me. I like Gilbertus. Yeah. I, I, I like him a lot. I think he's a fool for keeping Erasmus around. Oh, I like Erasmus a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Is this guy not walking a thin edge? <laughs> <laughs> I want to know how how Erasmus makes the changes because like he's not supposed to be hooked up to anything, and then he's like, "Well, Erasmus did the programming on the." on the uh, half-charged-up uh, robots to charge up and stuff. It's like, how did he get access to that? And he also has these eyes that he, you know... Yeah, the watch they, eyes. Yeah, the watch everywhere. eyes that he can see everywhere yeah. and hear. Yeah. Now. Like how, was he have some sort of, like, Wi-Fi thing going on? Or? Yeah, they don't really explain that fully. Yeah. But... Uh, well, he, I'm he's really interested in to find out how Erasmus gets away. He's just in on everything. But, you know, I did get also kind of the feeling that Gilbertus does not really want to restore Erasmus to what he was previously. Yeah. yeah, he is definitely a conflicted man. He, I mean, Erasmus, for all intents and purposes, is his father. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And he knows that and respects that and loves the conversations and has learned a lot from him. But at the same time, he also acknowledges the harm that Erasmus has done and you know, yeah. and has built fail, fail safes in when he does let Erasmus out to make sure that he doesn't do anything rash or that would get them in trouble. I think he even says it at some point. He's like, being exposed to all these people has made me realize that things aren't what I thought they were. Yeah. And they really push that out in the, the beginning of the next book. They push that out. A little bit more backstory to Gilbertus that we'll, we'll see. Okay. Mm. So kind of explores exactly what you're saying. That like he's yeah. been exposed to people, and they, they kind of revisit what happened immediately after the battle of Corin, yeah. and uh, you see that. Yeah. But, how about, yeah. Gilbert, how about yeah. Gilbertus's uh, uh, star pupil Drago? I was waiting for what was going to happen with him. They, they were building him up, building him up, and then that was, I thought that was cool that he was with Venport. Yeah, yeah. They took him there, and they had that kind of mental battle. Dude, that battle, I thought for sure Ven Part and him were gone. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, the whole thing that I'm screaming to myself while, I'm, while I was listening to it is like, isn't there a way they could get a mess navigators to just pop in with more ships and like <laughs> more warships and stuff? Like, how, where are the navigators? Where are the navigators? So <laughs> I'm glad that, that happened at least in some way. Right. Right. Well, it did. Now, am I correct or, or mistaken that Venport is sending students to the school to be trained specifically for his use? Yeah. Well, he has sent he has sent um, Drago there so they can teach other mentats 
for Van Port. Oh, okay. It's kind of it's kind of the, it's kind of the goal of him. I thought he had, he still had a couple more at the school. Well, he might, uh, but uh, but that seems to be what I got from it. That that was kind of the purpose of Drago. Okay. But, yeah. but. A side note to the whole Van Port thing: that prisoner that then became a that turned into a navigator. Yes. That yeah. was a real story. Uh, yes. There's got to be more to that. And I wonder if we aren't going to see something happen. I don't yeah. trust them. I don't either, even though <laughs> both Norma and him say that, you know, his his mental functions on a high enough level now that that stuff doesn't matter matter, or he wouldn't even think about it anymore. Yeah. I mean, what we, what we do get from him is the introduction to this, uh, you know, the AI shipyards, the... Uh, yeah. That they're that that basically Gilbertus and Drago kind of discover together and confirm, and then each reveal to different parties. And it's funny the way that kind of plays out and pits them at odds. Yeah, that story was kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a lot going on there. Like that's that whole plot. Line. That, that plot line was good. So rescued, and he goes. Um, so I have another situation. I mean, his wife comes in to have another situation we have to deal with, and. Then Porter's like groans. He's like, "Oh, Polarians again!" Yeah. And, and it's not. It's the uh, now we have a chance to bring in the sisters. I, <laughs> well, isn't it? Isn't it also neat how Gilbertus has kind of cozied up to Manford? Cozy, cozied up is a very optimistic word, Jim. Very forced. Very. I think it's for. I, cozied up is not the word that I would use when I think of Gilbertus and uh, and uh, Manford. Well, you know, I think Gilbertus knows that the only way he's going to protect Erasmus from being discovered and destroyed is by being on the inside of uh, the power structure that could do that. I, I also think he's forced. <sighs> he is kind the of safety, the safety of the school. I think what would be a great place for their school to be alone is turned against them. Their yep. Location, 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 you know? Right. Yeah. Same problem the sisters had. Well, because they're on the same planet. Yeah. You know, and so I think there's, there's certainly that, but remember that he, he's kind of, he, was late a machine sympathizer because of his debate that he had mm -hmm. and it, it's i think it'd be silly to think that man for toronto once all other enemies are gone won't turn on people that have been labeled at one time or another as machine sympathizers to keep his vendetta and his crusade going yeah mm -hmm. yeah that was almost a fatal mistake right yes it was yes very very bad mistake yeah I mean, worse so than, than challenging the girl who he knew was a Butlerian sympathizer yeah. with the half-charged-up mechs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we, we have Norma, uh, Norma Senva, who she asserts herself quite strongly a couple of times here. Oh, yeah. What surprised me is after she saves... Uh, Benport. Benport. They're they're like regrouping back at the back on the planet, and the mentat is kind of giving him options and stuff, and she starts talking about prescience, and he's just like enough of that, Norma. I don't have time for your nonsense, and I'm like whoa 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 she just saved you and you like, get back and you're like well, okay okay whatever shut up. You know, like, yeah. <laughs> well, you know she does bring up a great point though. You know mentats can make. I mean, and this is comes clear with Drago. He goes, Mentats make predictions on known data. Mm -hmm. And what isn't known data is the prescience. Yeah. You, you can't know that. It's uh, impossible mm. to know. And I like how she says, even with them. Okay, let me back up. It, it's, in, this, in that society, it's impossible to know unless you're Paul. <laughs> yeah. And then you know. Well, you, you, she's like, you know, the navigators look to the future to find the best path, and there's never just one. Hmm. Like good paths. That's a great quote. I think you just found your quote. I found my quote. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can wrap it up now. Because <laughs> I, <laughs> I I think the most tragic story, the saddest story, is uh, Doctor Orizoma. I think that that's a story that that storyline pissed me off the most. Well, okay, I I, I say that about a. Well, you know, when they bring a prosthetic in good faith, yeah, 
to uh, Manfred Rondo, and then they destroy it. Yeah. And um, well, who who's his sidekick? Uh, it was another Talaxu guy. No, it wasn't the Talaxu guy. Oh, is that? Oh, I'm sorry. Orizoma, the Talaxu guy. That's what I was thinking of. No, or, or, and, and then, Orizoma yeah. was was the Souk School head. That oh, became, oh, okay. Yeah. Got him confused. I'm yeah, sorry. you're thinking of Ptolemy. What? Yeah, you skipped ahead and went to Ptolemy. Oh, Ptolemy. Yeah. The yeah. piece. <laughs> <laughs> but, but no, the uh, so yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, move along. Yeah, <laughs> this is the guy. He was in be wasn't he like embezzling money and stuff? Well, that was that was the doctor before that was running the school, and doctor okay. so doctor Zoma killed him. And this is a this is a lady that was tortured. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I you know, she, well, she, you know, I, if you remember, the sisterhood appointed her to deliver the treatment that was going to right. cause uh, Carino to be sterile. Yeah, and she has such a uh, she has such a muddy she, head. I mean, she yeah. was developing drugs and selling them like in the black market, mm -hmm. and it was one of the things that threw her out of the sisterhood mm -hmm. initially. And so this was her way of getting back in. So she's kind of coerced into this. Financially, they're struggling. The mm. school's struggling, and so this is a way to help the school financially. And yeah. she saved the school by killing the former leader, but then it's turned against her. Yeah, as uh, not being something that saved it. She's blamed for the financial problems of yeah. the school. So, it is a sad story. It is a sad story. I gotta say, I kind of like zoned out, and then. Also, I was like, "Wait, someone's being tortured." I had to rewind. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, Wait a minute, what did I miss? Yeah. 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 The Karinas uh, are are absolutely horrible people. <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay. So Ptolemy. <laughs> Let's talk about him. I mean, yeah. what do you think was going to happen? Bringing the stuff to him. He obviously, when we talked to him, he was obviously very nice. Yeah. Right. Well, and and but he is also the antithesis of Manford. He is. He thinks he believes that if you develop technology, or I should say, he did believe before Manford got a hold of him, that if you develop technology carefully enough, that it can be controlled and it's actually beneficial, rather than a problem right you know if like, he, he developed he, the if he developed the right technology it would be it would free people to do bigger things but when when manford came in and killed his friend in front of him and destroyed the lab that completely changed his entire agenda and turned him into a fanatic just exactly the opposite yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So much so that he's bringing back the Cymax. Yeah. Yes. I, I he's he's got an interesting storyline. I'm excited to see where that goes. Absolutely. How that works. What I really want to do is see the Cymax take out man for Toronto. That's yes. why that's my uh, goal. But <laughs> oh, half man for but unfortunately we know that that's not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. The Butlerians are going to win out in the end, unfortunately. But I I disagree with that because you the the Butlerian movement has clearly died by the time we get to the House books. Yeah, I mean the the, the Orange Catholic Bibles around, and we know that the um, uh, there's certainly no one has built machines like they are, and machines are kind of gone. But we don't really the Butlerians are really not a presence. So I think I think by the end of book three, we're going to be brought to head. We're we're going to find out why that is. I don't well, think. I'm, I'm thinking that Ptolemy. Uh, I'm thinking that Ptolemy is going to give rise to Ix. Oh yeah, I can see that. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah, I can see that. I I think that P 
people are going to turn against the Butlerian Jihad because the way that the Butlerian Jihad is talked about in future books doesn't, when you really think about it, doesn't really fit what we know of the Butlerian Jihad because um, it's it's one of those things where like they're like, oh, you want the Butlerian Jihad to happen again where everyone was smashing everything? It's not like they're talking about the they're the thinking to, machines. Yeah, referring to the thinking machines. They're they're referring to fanatics who went over. I think that that's. I think that they learn a lot from the Butlerian the Butlerians, but I think that this movement here gives them a bad name and scares people enough. Scares the emperor. Yeah, the emperor's the emperor's in fear of Manfred Trondo. But, I mean, yeah, it's going to end in the accord or whatever they call them to keep people from doing things, but it, you know, it's, it's going to scare them enough to keep the, 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 the they're not going to want to be fanatics anymore. Do you think also- then perhaps that the Carinos with the, with bringing about the Sardaukar may put things into perspective by destroying Manford and his, his deal. And it just brings thing in, things into perspective. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Have we really have we really seen the beginning of the Sardaukar yet? Not yet. I don't know if it will, but I guess we, I mean it gets. I mean, it could, but we don't uh, really see the. I mean, right now the the army when we see them on the the with the Bene Gesserit, they're kind of. Well, the capital still on Seleucus, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So it's not moved to Kaitan yet, or whatever. Yeah. That when does that happen? Does that ever happen? Have we and, seen at a house? Blows yeah. them up. They don't talk about which one. Yeah. Well, Seleucia becomes a wasteland, right? Eventually, it was when it gets nuked by a house, I don't remember. Right. Does that happen in the house books? That happens in the house books. No. Mm-hmm. When does that happen? It was way before that, because like the Sardaukar. We saw like, that in one of the books we read. Right. It must have happened in the Legends. What book? I think it was a flashback in like one of the. The the um, what do they call it? Like, uh, well, we get the idea. Winds who, of Dune or something. Who is the guy that develops the? Who begins to have a vision for Rackus and making a green? The scientist. Yeah. Well, that that was uh, Pardo Kind. Yeah. So his father was the was also wasn't he the uh, wasn't he the imperial scientist and had studied on Seleucus Secundus? Uh, that, that was that was his son Liet. Yeah. Yeah. Pardo. Yeah. Yeah. He studied. On because there, it was, it, was after, like, it was destroyed already at that. Yeah, point. yeah, got it. Was it that we saw the flashback? Saw, like, the to flashback the, to the guy who destroyed it. Destroyed? I don't. I can't remember. I'm, yeah, I forget. I, at I, some I, point I forget. We covered it, but yeah, but, we yeah. did. And I forget what book that is. Yeah, Roland would know if he was here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So who else do we have to cover? No, we covered most of the people. Not all of them, but most. I think that's the major, the major character. Yeah. Yeah. We've, yeah. we've talked about our favorite plot lines. Yeah, we did. We talked about it. And no, uh, we talked about most of the uh, places. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, we kind of covered themes. Any, th- any other themes that we want to cover? We talked about the political stuff and how it kind of relates to now. Um, the obvious technology versus not technology. Still exploring the the dangers of technology in comparison with uh, not in the. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know if we see the dangers of it, but we see the dangers of people just saying, "Oh well," just blanket statements about technology. You yeah. see the dangers of that. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think mm-hmm. that's gonna that's gonna go through all three books. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. Yeah. we we also get a glimpse at uh the Fremen mm-hmm. and how they feel yeah. how they but they're called free men in this one. Right. Well, and that's what they were called initially. Yeah. Free men. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's probably till the Harkonnens take over that they're Fremen or something. Yeah. Down. Yeah. So yeah, I don't feel or even places that we need to yeah. move move into. Yeah, well, let's go to let's go to favorite quotes. I mean, mine I was we covered mine already. That's the only one I had. So for uh, listeners, this is the first book I've taken in as an audio book, and as a result, I feel very disconnected from 
the quotes, the quotes, the material, the characters. Uh, it wasn't as um, engrossing, so it was a learning experience. So, will you, the question is, will you do that again? Probably not for the show. Okay. Unless I'm on a time constraint, I probably won't do it. Because yeah. that's all I've done. Yes. Yeah. Is, is I've only Some people can take it in, but I found that for me. I almost just sit and just listen. And if I'm going to do that, I might as well just read it. Right. Because I'm not doing anything else. So I can't, I can't multitask it or, or I can't focus. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, Jim, why don't you go ahead and uh, share us your quotes, and then I have a few quotes here. Okay. Uh, well, I have a few. Uh, I, I found a lot, a lot of quotes, but these are my favorites. Reality does not change just because you don't like the data. And that was Gilbertus during the debate. That is and, a phenomenal quote. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, rabid faith is the biggest problem humanity faces now. And the next age of reason will not come easily in this time of magical beliefs and superstitious fear. And that was uh, Venport when he was talking with Dr. Zoma. Um, and my third one is, it is easy to look backwards and cast blame on others but more difficult to gaze ahead and take responsibility for your own decisions and your own future. And that was Griffin Harkonnen in his final dispatch from Arrakis. Some awesome quotes. Hey, just hang on a moment here. Go ahead. My son is sick, so. Uh, oh, bummer. Yeah, he, he was. Uh, I came home from school early to wa- watch him while Chris had a job. And so. Um, so here's some of my quotes. All right. Um, all right. So um, I like this one. Uh, Life is filled with tests one after another. And if you don't recognize them, you're certain to fail the most important ones. So that was good. Who said that? Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know who said it. Brian Harvard. He wrote the book. <laughs> um, um, I also, this was said by Dorotea uh, to uh, Valia. As mortal humans, we're born with a death sentence anyways. So what difference does a little poison make? Why not take a chance you'll survive the ordeal and make something significant in your life? <laughs> a little reckless there. Um, and uh, there's a couple others here. Let me see. Um, this one plays right into our discussion of how much we hate what the Balerians are doing and our discussions of it. Um, but the Balerians turn fear into violence and panic into a weapon. By creating imaginary problems and raising the specter of non-existent enemies, they transform common people into the wild herd that destroys everything they do not understand. I thought that was uh, sums up that yeah. conversation quite nicely. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, um, we're a little light on feedback. We do have some feedback, though. Some, so let's go ahead and cover that feedback. We'll do that, yeah, let's do the feedback, and then we have some good reviews, bad reviews. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then uh, we can kind of wrap up the show. Sounds good to me. So, so Roland Smoker, hi Roland, we uh, love you dearly on the show here, and we just uh, and hope you're having fun at PAX. But he writes in and says, "Hi David, Scott, and Jim. That's you, Jim. Um, unfortunately, I have not yet finished Sisterhood of Dune, but I've enjoyed what I've read so far. It's nice to be back in the pre-Dune era. My one complaint would be that they have too many important characters at first. That being said." I would have had a hard time determining which character storyline to remove. They're all good. But at the beginning, I had a hard time keeping all the different characters straight. I eventually got it all sorted out. Hopefully the next two books will be better, as I imagine most of these characters will carry over. So far, I give this book a 4.5 out of 5. Yeah, you know, I think he just kind of mirrored what we said. You know, it was a little jarring at the first. Took a little Mm -hmm. bit to warm up. I don't, I don't think that means it's a bad book. I just think it's, you know, it would have been better if we read it right after. Well, I mean, and, and this is the, and this is, and that's the thing. And we're, we're coming off like the last Dune, real Dune book we read was the wrap up of the series. Right. 
a whole different cast of characters existing <laughs> then. Uh, years, right? Yeah, I mean, okay, except for Erasmus and Norma yeah. Senba, who are still around, right? <laughs> After all this time, yeah. but other than and, oh, and Omnius, but you know, you, really, it's a entirely new cast right. overall. And um, so it is jarring. You have all these characters, and, you're, and I'm trying. I'm like, okay, it's this person. How is she connected to the people I remember from then? Oh, this is like three generations later, right. and I'm trying to keep this all straight. Um, and well, obviously a Harkonnen, but how does this fit into Xavier Harkonnen? And and I and I, so yeah. I'm with them in that because yeah. not only is it the only people that were kind of okay with is Gilbertus and and Vorian and, and, and Norma, but uh, other than that, these other people are a couple generations later. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I and agree. I felt the same way um, about some of the descendants when we were reading some of the later books after Dude, where they would bring in a person's family, and you're like. Oh well, obviously that's connected to this family line, but how? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. Jim, your thoughts on this? Jim? Yes. Uh, uh, what? Your, oh, your thoughts on this? You froze for a second. Oh, sorry. Um, um, yeah, but your thoughts on what Roland's saying? Oh, I agree. There is a train load of characters here that could be difficult to keep track of. Um, but I, I don't know. I guess I was, I was re I really got immersed into this book. It was just, I just really enjoyed it. Plus the notes that I took, I'm sure I, I know you guys have thoroughly researched the notes that I left for you, you, did, you did. on, on the Google drive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. And, um, the <laughs> But I put them there for mostly my benefit, <laughs> and reading reading back through them, there there is there is a lot of stuff here to sort out. So I have to agree with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. I'm trying. I'm just uh, check. Next next time, instead of taking notes, I'll do a dissertation on the loot and see if you guys yeah, actually. Yeah, agree. I will definitely. <laughs> I will definitely. I was hoping the loot would be brought up because, uh, and <laughs> and I just want you. I just will go in the record, Jim, that David and I didn't bring up the loot yeah, this time. This whole episode, we were we were good the whole time, the whole time. But now all I can picture is you riding at the front of Mannion's army, yeah. you know, with the loot, with Mannion, riding yeah. riding on the shoulders of Mannion, who's riding on the shoulders of Idaho. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, there and you go. I'm like a loot player. There he goes. Yeah. You know, leading <laughs> on the jihad against the thinking machine. <laughs> Way to go, yep. Jim. Very good. Yeah. Brave, so, brave Sir Robin. Brave Sir Robin ran away. <laughs> <laughs> Coconuts, bring them in. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, uh, you know, if we were to rewrite that scene in Monty Python style, I would actually enjoy the manual. The manual because style. when they would ride into a village to like <laughs> conquer it or take it, and there they are with coconuts and like, ah. <laughs> because they don't like technology. <laughs> right. Exactly. Horses are technology. <laughs> so, I jumped on uh, YouTube to check our comments for the last uh, since last time. Yeah, and uh, we had one here that says uh, from Brian Brennan, who says, "Does anybody wonder why Frank Herbert never explored the idea of interstellar sports teams? I think competitive sports will be. I think competitive sport will be stick with human. Competitive sport will stick with humanity forever. Have something like the heinous Harkonnen harlots." Versus the superior Seleucid Sardaukar, in some <laughs> form of future sport, they evolved alongside humanity because we're, we'll always have uh, some sort of an Olympics. <laughs> That's pretty good. Well, you know, and, and sports aren't really explored in the Zoom world a heck of a lot, except for arena sports like uh, right. like gladiator type stuff. Gladiator stuff. Yeah, and, yeah. I, and I guess they had they did in this book have some sports where they were fighting robots or robots fighting robots at one point. Yeah, that's true. I forgot about so, undercover. Yeah, was, mm -hmm. yeah, undercover like yeah. like fight club with robots. Yeah. Robot, Although, robot but, fight club is you don't talk about robots. In my mind, oh, this is more of like a Romanish time of yeah. of that where, entertainment. Yeah. But then they, they would have Exactly. Race. Sports and entertainment uh, is not in this era that we're reading in. It's not for the masses. Yeah. yeah, absolutely not. It, it is. It is for. It is for the rich, much like it was in uh, the the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries yeah. before the industrial revolution. Yeah. I mean, when these guys want 
entertainment, they pull out their lutes. Right. Yeah, and, their uh, Arrowwood uh, brand loot. Yeah, yeah, Arrowwood brand loot. Absolutely. And uh, talking about only, 17th only century. Yeah. But what do you say, Jim? <laughs> We're talking about the 17th century. Oh, the yes, 17th century. Yeah. yeah, I guess I, I guess that predates you by a century or something. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, according to some of the some of the kids I teach, they think I they think I was around when Moses was no, I mean, you know, when you're riding at the head of Mannion's army with the, loot, with the loot, you are able to part the Red Sea. I'm just yeah, saying that it happens. Um, ultimate you know, power. Yeah, just, uh, you, all you have to go is do a little pint of the Harkonnens and get well for you're good. My question for you though, Jim, is who did they get cast to play you playing the loot in the new Ben Hur? So, <laughs> oh, hey, uh, that's easy. It's got to be George Clooney. <laughs> my, my twin george clooney yeah. yes, yes, yes absolutely he got uh, all my cool you know yeah. what can I say? well let me just read uh one or two because we are running long here yeah, okay, yeah, one so. or two uh bad reviews and i'm going to start out with a one star review because okay. this guy absolutely loved this book <laughs> obviously uh -oh. obviously yeah so so this is from delicious strawberry because hey if you're gonna have a bad review you might as well have it from a delicious strawberry <laughs> playing a lute um, or something like that. Something like but that. yeah, one star review and said, and he starts out with this time to milk the cash cow yet again. Oh, Before geez. all the Mac, the Mac Dune books come out, <laughs> Brian and Kevin claimed that they had found Frank Herbert's Dune 7 on some floppies or something like that. They, however, have offered no evidence of said notes and or of floppies, which throws the entire matter of their were there really notes into question. In fact, the Brian and Kevin's handling of Dune 7 and Hunters and Sandworms primarily evinced by their complete tossing out of the message of Leto's Golden Path has established by Frank Herbert their retconning the fact that Daniel and Marty were face dancers, again established by Frank Herbert and Chapter House of Dune and changing them into omnius and Erasmus, along with so many other things that they did wrong, show over notes they did not use them. So that's the way it begins. Uh, it's not done yet. There's oh more. Boy. There's more. Oh boy. This was exacerbated by the fact that rather than starting Dune 7 as their first project, they instead did two prequel trilogies, the House Trilogy and the Butler and Jihan Trilogy, with more bad writing and retcons before they finally got around to Dune 7. They butchered Frank Herbert's legacy with Hunters and Sandworms, dude. And if this was not enough, they had to do some stupid in betweenquels, um, further insulting the memory of Frank Herbert without even with even more retcons, including the ultimate retcon, which is basically said that anything that happened in the real Dune books were just historical inaccuracies of facts that were made up by Irulan and other historians. So basically, what Brian and Kevin told us was that Frank's Dune was no longer canon, and that we're supposed to accept Brian and Kevin's poorly written fan fiction as canon. He has no opinion, by the way. No opinion. Not going to happen, folks. Nothing will ever top Frank Herbert's Dune, no matter how many books Brian and Kevin churn out. I will never accept their Mech Dune books as canon either. So now after prequels, sequels, and in betweenquels, we have a pre-sequel, sequel to the prequel trilogy. That makes me wonder, after finishing this series, as well as the Heroes of Dune series, that they'll do a sequel for Hunter's Sandworm, what basically is a, a C-sequel, Oi, very, <laughs> but that's something for another day. Then he actually gets to the book. Oh my goodness! Really? Yeah, yeah. So this is all like his diatribe no, no, about no opinion. No, 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 no opinion whatsoever. What do you think? Any thoughts on this, Jim? I mean, uh, yeah. Um, it it sounds like this guy thinks that Brian and Kevin are trying to destroy what. Frank Herbert created rather than adding to it. And when, as, after reading the last book we, we read, Brian's biography of his father, uh, which absolutely wipes out everything this, this guy says in my mind. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I would agree. Yeah. He's not done. So now here's, uh, here, oh here he is, uh, but no, here is his comment. He, he actually does take a step back, just a little bit. Okay. This oh. book is another desperate attempt to milk a cash cow. Frank Herbert only wrote six books for Dune, and it's too bad that he died before he could do the seventh Dune book. 
So far, Brian and Kevin have written 11 McDoon books, including this one. It's one thing to write one or to finish for someone who died before they can finish writing, but 11 books just overkill, and they have more planned. While this book was actually better than most of the other McDoon books, so that's his little concession, <laughs> the Inbetweequels and Dune 7, it still suffers much of the same problems that are rife through all the McDoon books. I found myself impatiently reading through parts just to get to the next scene because much of the story felt unnecessary or repetitive, something I found in all the other McDoon books. Uh, Frank Herbert could have handled all the founding of three schools in one book, he had a flair for painting one big picture and making us think. Other negative reviewers for this book already explained in detail what's wrong with this book, so I shan't go into it further as my review has already gotten long enough. Um, this whole McDoon debacle is actually making me think of Star Wars franchise. I'm just going to actually call it there, but I do want to say one thing. I did think about it point as I was reading this book, like, oh, they're reestablishing something that we already knew. And there were times where he did that, like, what, like they did it more than one time for certain characters, uh, and I wonder. Constantly stating the full name. Of yeah, the yeah, or like yeah. you know, reestablishing that is you know, who had done this, who had tortured people so many times, yeah, yeah, and they yeah. say that, and and so I do hear him on that part. I didn't feel the way he feels about this book. I like this book. Of all of the McDoon book, uh, this one. I felt had the least repetition in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, I had been kind of worn out by that and I didn't, I didn't feel it much except for con the only place that really stuck out to me is constantly reminding me that what's her face was in Idaho. I was like, I get it. She's in Idaho. I, yeah. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, there are some other long, let me read a shorter one here. This is actually a little bit more positive. And we'll end with this one. But I don't have any opinion. No, no opinion. Not at all. No opinion. Um, uh, so this is from Kernos, who gave it four stars. So okay. I, feel like, I feel like after reading that one, I felt kind of dirty. We need yeah. to do something a little bit more positive here. In my opinion, this is the best book so far of the Dune prequels or expanded universe, whichever you prefer. Exist into the, a nod from which many branches remain to be explored. I wanted to give it a five, but only dude gets that in this universe. It approaches 4.5. The book is all about beginnings, beginnings of major powers of Dune. That's what I said. Um, though it does explore the Bene Gesserit's beginnings, here called the Sisterhood, and the First Reverend Mothers, it gives most almost equal time to the beginnings of the Mentats, the Suit Doctors, and hints about the Imperial Conditioning, the Imperium, the Landstrad, the Zlaxu, the Navigators, the Fremen, the Spice Mining, the Atreides, and Harkin and Feud. All of these join into this nexus, and I can imagine each one being explored in more depth in further novels. And it's quite an exciting prospect. Further, the book is about the Blitlerian Jihad, not against the thinking machines, they're all dead and gone, but against, well, okay, they aren't all dead and gone, but against humans who acknowledge you to enhance their lives. And exploring this thing, the authors create a scathing polemic against forces of fundamentalism, conservatism, and theocracy that plague our own civilization today. They show that exploring the future can be like exploring the past, that humans will always be doomed to destruction and chaos by righteousness. Um, many give short shrift to the Doom prequels, but Brian and Kevin, I've enjoyed them and agree they have not maintained the literary quality of Frank's seminal, seminal novels, but I most strongly recommend this novel to Dune lovers, even if one has not read the other prequels. The Sisterhood of Dune could stand on its own with perhaps a little help from so you yeah. liked it. I, I mean, I agree with if you were going to have someone start with this book, they need help. Yeah, they, they do need a little bit of context yeah. to it. Mm -hmm. but. Any, any further comment, Jim? Yeah, I, uh, I thought that a lot of what uh, that reviewer said is spot on. Yeah. 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 Especially the way the book, Go ahead. especially the way the book speaks to what I see going on today. Yeah. Yeah. This idea of fundamentalism and um, a boat. I, I, you know, if we don't watch, we're going to get into politics here. But you know, you see it all over the place in politics, both yeah. in, both in both in liberals and conservatives, and this idea and a pushing of agenda with an intolerance for another. It's just it's insane. But yeah. Well. Yeah. 
on the tone of reviews, Scott, what's your what's your review for this book? My review, my number, my rating. Yeah. Um, this is great. I'm going to give it a four out of five. Okay. I enjoyed it. All not right. not my favorite book of everything we read. Yeah. But I did enjoy this book, and it was good. Yeah. Jim. Okay, being the as much as I enjoyed this book, and as quickly as I did read it, because I I didn't want to stop reading and i'm giving this a five easily wow yeah i'm actually going for the five i'm actually going to give it a five as well i i had um, very little to this book that i did not enjoy um listening to experience story-wise i mean the things i didn't like it are definitely nitpicking as far as title and uh the i I felt like it, it had its characters were everything from extremely likable to extremely hateable, uh, everywhere in between uh, the characters, you know, even a couple characters you just didn't care about. Um, but you felt like they were there for you to not care about. But mm-hmm. what at this point in time, if the quality of book continues through the next two, which I assume it ends after three, I could see myself rereading these this set alone by itself at this point because the story has been that good. Uh, there's no other there's no other p- series of books in the Dune. No, I'm talking like collection of like three um, outside uh, in the McDune books. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's, let's go with that. There's uh, none of the other. None of the other Brian Herbert, Kevin J. Anderson books have struck me so hard that I said I would want to reread just those three books, and then I could be done. Right. I, it was it, to me. It's always I would want to read this book, but if I did that, I'm going to have to keep going. Right. Because I want. I just want to encompass the whole universe. But right. if it continues at this quality, these three books could be read. To, I could read them on their own and enjoy the story. And I hear that if you do decide to reread them on your own, it would be they're especially good if they're accompanied by Jim playing the lute. Yeah, yeah, especially. Yeah. yeah, that's actually I'm going to write about the to the audiobook people and say you know you know one thing that would enhance this is, audiobook reading is yeah. just having a little bit of lute playing in the back on the background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be awesome. And I think that the cover like should just be like. Jim's jams. Jim jams. Like, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Meant it should be like an album. Jim's jams meant to accompany the reading of Doom. Yeah, and each <laughs> song is is twenty four hour twenty four hours long. Yeah, so you can just play it along. Yes, it's, it's like Dark Side of the Moon. Watching it with watching it with Wizard of Oz. Just put it on repeat. Yeah, just put it on Jim repeat. Turkeys. <laughs> I think it's time we wrap up the show. Yeah, I, I don't know about I, you. I think it is. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, so thanks to everyone who continues to support us. Um, absolutely, absolutely. We're we're coming to the end of this part of our adventure. Yeah, we uh, still got to talk about that. Yeah. Not tonight, though. Not tonight. Yeah, but we we we're we're definitely brainstorming and continuing on something new. So thank you, thank you, and we look forward to you coming in that journey as well. Our next book we're going to be reading is Mentats of Dune. Mentat. And that, so I'm excited about that. Um, and remember that you can get your comments to us at dunesagapodcast.com. The uh, forum's there. Facebook.com slash dunesagapodcast. Uh, at dunesagapodcast on Twitter. We've got a hotline. We've got, we got an email, dunesagapodcast at gmail.com. Yeah. Not there. Uh, a chat, 1260577chat, 1260577chat. And that will, that's 2428. You can also get it. Yeah. yeah. Facebook's a great place to do it. Facebook, too. yeah. A lot of people commenting. If a really cool guy posted a, a role playing manual. Yeah, I saw that. That was, yeah, really yeah, cool. yeah, that was really cool. So uh, definitely share stuff on uh, the Facebook uh, there. Um, so, yeah, great, great ways to get. Uh, thanks again to all of our Patreon supporters. Absolutely. To, to do great stuff. So, once again, for the Dune Saga podcast, I'm David Moulton. I'm Scott Hertzog. And I'm Jim Arrowwood. And may Shai Hulud clear the path before you. Phenomenal. Yeah. That was a good show. Yeah. Good show. Probably one of our longer shows. Yeah, probably. Yeah. I mean, we combined things. So. Yeah. But, but we talked a lot. The first hour was really talking about the book. Yeah. Yeah. We did. Yeah. Um, we really did a sec- We really we had a lot of good stuff to come back. Yeah, absolutely. To. So. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Cool. All right. Well, I guess when we'll get in line, we'll talk about when we're going to do yeah. next. Yeah. 
Oh, you want yeah. me to stop the broadcast? Well, I didn't. I mean, I mean, we, we can talk about anything personal.